Philippians chapter 2, there we go. Technical difficulty there on my part. Uh, if you've been here, we've, we've been co- going through Philippians, and Philippians is one of my favorite books, personally, which I would, as a preacher, you probably, your favorite book is the one you're preaching through right now, but uh, I love the book of Philippians, and as you know, Paul's writing from a Roman prison, and he's chained to a guard, and um, last week we saw in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 27 through 30, that our lives should be worthy of the gospel, and that the gospel should deeply affect us, and that um, by us knowing the good news that, that God sent His Son to live and die for us and to take our punishment upon Himself, how that news, that should infiltrate us and, and uh, that it should affect us. And uh, I, last week I preached one twenty-seven through 2, chapter 4, and really you could, as you're preaching those or, or reading those, I could have preached just 27 through 30, and I could have preached this week, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And I gave some thought to that, but because um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 certainly connect to today's passage. But I wanted to spend a whole week, a whole week, a whole sermon on um, verses 5 through 11, because it's really all about Jesus, and I just wanted to do that. But this morning we're going to read verses 1 through 11 because I want you to see the connection between last week and this week. And then, uh, then we'll jump in. So Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So last week, like I said, we're... Our lives should be deeply affected by the gospel. In verse verse 2, Paul says, to complete my joy. And I didn't even think about this last week, and even this morning in Sunday school as I was discussing it. You know, I thought about the complete my joy, but if a man is in prison for preaching the gospel, and he says, he's writing to a church, and he says, to complete my joy, what would you expect that man to say? Can you come get me out of here? That's what I would probably say, right? Would you complete my joy by getting me out of here? But how, what does he say? Complete my joy. Paul's saying, this church at Philippi, I would be, I would, I would, my joy would be full if you would do this. And what does he say? Verse 2, to have unity. Verse 3, that they would have humility. And verse 4, that they would serve one another. He said, and then my joy will be full. Isn't that interesting? My joy will not be, I I won't, I don't even know that I'll, or my joy will be complete if you as a church will do these things. If you will have unity, humility, and serve one another. Tony Merida, or Tony Merida, he says this, he's a Bible commentator, he's a, he's a pastor and a preacher and a seminary professor, he's, I don't know how many hats he's got, several I guess, but he, uh, he says this, he says, unity is not the result of preaching on unity. It's the result of people adoring and emulating Jesus. The more we behold His glory and imitate His character, the more unified we will be as a church. See, I can tell us as a church that we should have unity until I'm blue in the face. But I don't have any power to change your heart. And uh, and I do, I do believe we have pretty good unity. I'm, that's not a sticky point or anything for me but 
But the way that we get unity as the church is we all look at Jesus and the example of Jesus and what Jesus did for us. And we, when we become unified around that, then we will, we will have unity. We will be humble. We will serve one another. And we'll see that in our text. So I just wanted to connect the ideas of humility, unity, and service because it's certainly right there in the passage. And then Paul is saying, verse 4, uh, look not only to your own interests but also to the interests of others. And then he transitions, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. So you're to have the same mind of Jesus. We're, our, our first point this morning is that we are to have the attitude of Jesus or the attitude of Christ. And so verse 5, uh, the ESV says, have this mind among yourselves. Your translate, or the NIV says, have this mindset. Or your translation may say attitude. But we all get the idea, right? We have this mind, that's a, a, have the mind of Jesus, have the attitude of Jesus, have the mindset of Jesus. Think about things that the way Jesus thinks about. So Jesus, as we'll see, he values humility and service more than self-exaltation. The ad attitude of Christians should reflect the attitude of Jesus. If we are followers of Jesus, if we belong to Jesus, we should think like Jesus. Paul says in, that Christians should, in verse 3, have humility. In verse 4, to serve others, to think of others before yourself. And then, as we will see, that is exactly the attitude of Christ. In verse 6, he displays humility. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And he emptied himself, verse 7. And then in, we see the attitude of Christ with service in taking the form of a servant, verse 7, and by becoming a man. The world lives to get and get and get. The world tells us that we need more pleasure, we need more praise, we need people to tell us how great we are, that we um, need more money. The world says you need this and you, you should get more and more and more. But what Paul's saying in this text is that we are to imitate Jesus who came to what? To give and give and give. So as we look at our text this morning, I want to ask you, are you a person that seeks to get and get and get? Or do you live to give and give and give? And is this our mindset as a church? And I, I thought about that this morning, or I've, I've thought about that, um, that as a church, of course, we want to reach more people for Christ. And we want more people, and, and maybe some of us may say, well, even, even in time, we would hope we would have to maybe even build a bigger building or whatever. Or we want, we want the pews to be full, and we want this, we want the budget to go up, and we want these things to happen. But really, our focus is to give, to give and give and give. If we, like at, the, at, the, uh, at, the, at our uh, trunk retreat that we're going to do, our focus is not to, to get and get and get more people. Our focus is to give and give and give and serve and love. And at the proper time, we'll, we'll hope, we want God to do the exalting. We want to humble ourselves and let God exalt us in due time. But anyway, that's just an aside. But we're to have the attitude of Christ. And then next, we're to learn humility from Christ. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin. Jesus' humble renunciation. When you renounce something, that means that you, you give it up. When I, or, or you, you, uh, whenever I say renunciation, well, we'll just look at the text and that will help explain it. The first, the first phrase in verse 6 is, Who... Though he was in the form of God, that's our first little phrase. So the form of God, Jesus did not just have God-like qualities or appearance, but Jesus was of the same nature or essence of God. So in our Sunday night studies, we've been going through the Baptist faith and message, and, and I'm quickly losing track of how many weeks ago it was when we talked about this, but the Trinity. There are three, we have one God, the Bible is clear about that, Deuteronomy 6.4 that there's one God. But we have three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are distinct persons, but one God. 
And if you don't understand that completely, you're not alone, all right? But that's what the Bible teaches. But look at John chapter 1 uh, up on the screen. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, this is referring to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him there was, or was not anything made that was made. So Jesus is Creator. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all had a role in creation. John 17, 5, Jesus is praying in the garden and He says this, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus, He is begotten. He came down from the Father on, to live on earth, but He's not created. He has always existed with the Father. And this is something that's fundamental to Christianity. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. And we're, there's a reason that we're getting there. But Jesus, verse 6, though He was in the form of God, He did not, the next phrase, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. So even though that was His rightful place right there with the Father, He did not count that as something to be grasped. He was, it's not something, when you grasp something, what are you doing? You're holding on to it, right? That's what it means to grasp something. But Jesus did not consider that something, that position of deity and that elevated position. He didn't consider that something to be grasped. But it said, but it, it goes on and says he made himself nothing. But we're just talking about this. So Jesus, when he, the incarnation, when Jesus came and became a man, he did not lose his deity. Jesus, His incarnation was not the subtraction of deity, but He took on flesh. He added the flesh on. He had added humanity, right? He was always, He's the eternal Son of God. He's always been God. But then when He came to earth, He took on flesh. Look at, uh, well, I'll get there later, I guess. Sorry. Although Jesus was God, think about this. When Jesus was on earth, He's fully God, fully man, He's on earth. He is God in the flesh. And we'll see that in, in a verse later. He's God in the flesh. So if you think about it, every person that Jesus encountered, they should have bowed down to Him. If they would have recognized Him for who, who He truly was, they would have bowed down, wouldn't they? If you knew that if, if uh, you know, back in the old times, or in, the old times, still in some countries... When you go visit the leader of that country or the king or the whatever the phrase is, what do you do? You bow down to him, right? That's in some countries. And that used to be the standard everywhere. You went and you, you saw somebody. If you encountered the, the person that's in charge, you went and you bowed down to him. Every person that Jesus encountered should have bowed down to him and praised him. And, uh, but how did Jesus live? He lived with an open hand, right? Jesus did not go around and say, you should praise me, you should praise me, you should praise me. Jesus went around healing the sick, making the blind to walk, or I'm sorry, messed that up, making the blind to see, um, helping the deaf hear. He went around and he just loved and served. That's what Jesus did, really. He, he, he could have told everyone, you should bow down to me, but that's not what Jesus did. Think about this. We are tempted and we often live exactly the opposite of how Jesus lived, right? We are, we, Jesus is our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our Master. But yet, think about this. We, we, we want to have ourselves exalted. And we want to be the bosses or lords of our own lives. But Jesus emptied Himself and submitted to the will of the Father. We are discontent being a servant of God. We want to be in charge. That's, that's what happened with Adam and Eve, right? God puts them in charge of essentially all of earth, all of the creation. and says, I want you to have dominion. But they weren't content with just with the whole earth and being in charge. They said, remember what was Satan's lie? He said, you will be like God if you do this, if you take that. And they said, anyway, we could spend all day on that. But we reject God's word in sinful disobedience, but Jesus perfectly obeyed God's word. We give in to temptation, 
but Jesus overcame temptation. And because of Adam and Eve's sin, we live under a curse because of the fall. But Jesus took the curse for us. Look at Galatians 3.13 on the screen. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. I don't know if you ever read that verse, but Jesus became a curse for us. That's, put it, that's laying your life down for somebody. This morning, I want to ask you, are you grasping for pleasure or power or money? Is there something that you're after, something that's not a godly ambition? Is there something that you are wanting this morning that doesn't belong to you or, or you're, you're not seeking to, to give and give but to get and get? There are... There are um, I hesitate to even talk about this, but I'm going to. And that's usually a, not, not the way you should do it. But there are, there's a movement in our denomination in Southern Baptist for women to preach. And there are popular people that you, you would know their name if I mentioned that are saying that women should, can and should preach on Sunday mornings to, to men, to men and women. And, um, and I'm not against women teaching, all right? Women, Titus 2, we see that. Women are to teach women. The older women are to help the younger women. That's totally biblical. But in a mixed company, in mixed men and women, the Bible is clear about that men and women are equal in a sense that we are all creating God's image, but we're different. We have different roles in the church and in the home. And these, these ladies, they are, they are seeking something that God has not given them to do. And they're not content being a wife and being... Uh, a, a mother, or even being a Bible teacher to women, that's not enough. But that we had that if they are not up here doing what I'm doing, then that, it's not good enough. And the Bible is clear about that. But we there's a and there's a there's just such a temptation for us. I mean, it's not just that. That's just one example. And I can, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can tell you more about that. But think about this. We do the same thing at a. Maybe there's somebody at your job, and you're, um, maybe the boss is about to leave. Maybe he, he or she's going to retire, and you can take their place. And maybe in order, because you want that position, you're going to, you're going to do whatever it takes to get it. And you're not going to, maybe you're going to talk bad about a coworker, Or maybe you're um, going to do whatever it takes to make that person look bad, to make you look better so you can get that position. That's a worldly mindset. But we're tempted to do that. We can want to do that. But Jesus says that we, he, he says, or Paul says, to live like Jesus. Rather than grasping for a position of power, what did Jesus do? He did not think, count it something to be grasped. He took on the form of a servant. Can you imagine if every, if how different our world would be? Or how different our, our church and our world if everybody lived to serve? Can you imagine if you went into a restaurant and ever in every restaurant experience was Chick-fil-A where that you they they really want to serve you and if you ask them something it's my pleasure. What if it was everyone's true pleasure to serve each other? What if everybody what if when you took your car to a mechanic and that mechanic wanted the very best for you and this was a, your experience at every that they weren't trying to gouge you and they weren't, I'm not, I'm not against mechanics, all right? I, there's a lot of good mechanics. But they're not trying to gouge you and, and charge you $50 to change a $5 air filter. And they're not trying to do this. But what if everybody said, I want to serve. I want to live like Jesus. How, how different would our world be if rather than, what if, what if we live to, um, to help others, to serve others? We didn't grasp on and we weren't trying to get and get and get but give. But going further, Jesus' humble incarnation, verse 7. It says, I'm just going to read verse 6 again. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now again, Jesus did not cease to be God, but rather when it says that he made himself nothing, he, um, he gave up his rights, in a sense, his rights to the praise of people uh, as far as in heaven. He gave up that position by the Father, and he came to earth. 
Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on human flesh. Look, look at John chapter 1, verse 14. This is basically the incarnation. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus became flesh. He was always God and then He became flesh. As you read the Gospels, and I hope you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I've noticed that it is Jesus who is always serving others. Have you noticed that? And I tried to explain that a while ago and I messed it up. But Jesus is the one that does the healing. Jesus is the one that does the ministering. Jesus is the one that uh, feeds the 5,000 and the 4,000. Jesus pours out and pours out and pours out. I've noticed... Uh, but, but us, we tend to want to be served. Uh, but Mark, Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but, or, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. I, Bethy and I were talking about this last night, and um, uh, what, probably the most popular preacher or pastor in America is Joel Osteen. And his book, his, famous, his most famous book is this, has this title, Your Best Life Now. Your Best Life Now. His, his follow-up book to that was Become a Better You. The focus is on what? You. Your best life now. Become a better you. That doesn't have the same ring to it as your best servant's life now. Or be the best servant you can be. That is antithetical to what Jesus taught. Jesus said, you come to serve. You, it's not about... The only way your best life now could be this life is if you're headed for hell. Because the Bible teaches that our next life is going to be way better, right? That we're not to become a better you. I'm not saying you shouldn't improve yourself, but... I had a, a, a friend of mine in Bethany's. She's from a different area. Um, I saw on her Facebook last night, it said, hashtag love yourself. What did Jesus tell us to do? To deny yourself. He said, if any person, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. We are never in the Bible said that we are to love ourselves. If you can, find, if you can show, it, show me where it's at, then I will, I will recant. We are, yes, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, we are created in God's image. We have value as people. I'm not saying we don't have value, but we are not commanded to love ourselves. We are commanded to love Jesus, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is, is like it, to love your neighbors as yourself. So we're to love others as we would care for ourselves. Not, not anyway, I thought of a, I'm sad that the youth aren't here because I finally came up with a really good illustration. And Julie's smiling because she knows about it. But hey, the story of Batman, whenever I thought about taking uh, the form of a servant, I thought about Batman. And you guys may be thinking, well, Matt, really? Batman? Um, but think about it. Who, who is Batman really? Who, who's the, Batman has a, a, he has the mask, he wears the cape. But underneath it is who? Bruce Wayne, right? Bruce Wayne, his parents were killed when he was a child, and he was raised essentially by his butler. And he was the owner or the CEO of Wayne Enterprises. So he's in the city of Gotham, and, the, and um, the Wayne Enterprises, he is a billionaire, 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 billionaire. He has everything you could want. If you're a, if you're a, a single man, or a man, or anyone really, but especially a single man in a big city, he owns the city, right, essentially. Everything is it's kind of like if you go to, to where Bethany's from in Rogers in northwest Arkansas, Walmart is there, Walmart home office. Everything in that area revolves around Walmart. That's the reason why that area has grown up, because Walmart home office. And then Tyson, and things have grown up there. But when you went to Gotham, everything uh, centered around uh, Wayne Enterprises. It was the focal point of the city, and this man owned it all. Bruce Wayne owned it all. He is a billionaire and he could have lived for all the pleasure that he could have taken. But 
in this movie that we're going to watch a clip, The Dark Knight Rises, I'm, I, I'm probably going to miss everybody here. There's probably very few people that have seen this. But in the clip, just to give you some context, Batman, he has been, um, he has been basically defeated by the, the bad guy, and he has been put in prison. And he comes out, and when he comes out, he still owns the city. He still is a billionaire. He does not have to go back. But the, but the city uh, has been bought. All the, there's no way into the city. The bridges have been cut off. And actually, his company, Wayne Enterprise, had come up with this hydrogen system. Fusion, it was basically electricity. They were going to power the whole city with this clean electricity. And this thing had been turned into a bomb. And so now this bomb is about to detonate in Gotham, in his city. And this is what... And so Batman goes back to the city. If you would, go ahead and play that clip. I got it. We have 45 minutes to save this city. No, I've got 45 minutes to get clear of the blast radius, because we don't stand a chance against these guys. With your help, I might. I'll open that tunnel, then I'm gone. There's more to you than that. Well. Sorry to keep letting you down. with me save yourself you don't owe these people anymore you've given them everything not everything not yet yeah I pretty much cried during that during this week while I was preparing and watching that clip over and over but what? But in that context, are we not Catwoman? That's Catwoman. Sorry, the the girl. Are we not her? What'd she say? Save yourself. You don't owe these people anything. She says, "I'm getting out of here." And here's the man who owns the city. And what is he doing? He's putting his life on the line. He he descends from that Wayne Tower and from his mansion, and he comes down there and he says. I'm going to, he says, she said, you don't know these people anything. And he says, she said, you've given them everything. And he said, no, not yet. Is that not Jesus? Do we not see the gospel there that Jesus didn't owe us anything? He didn't, he, he could have stayed with the Father. But Jesus came down, made himself nothing, and he took on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Verse 8, his crucifixion says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus' whole life was marked by humility. Think about this. When Jesus was born, where was he born? Rome? Athens? How about Jerusalem? No, he's born in Bethlehem. If you remember, when the wise men came, where did they come? When they came from the east, where did they go? They went to Jerusalem. Because that's what they would have expected where a king would come. But Jesus was born in a stable in a small town. So his, he lived 30 years in relative obscurity. Most people didn't know a lot. Uh, again, when, people when they interacted with Jesus, many people didn't realize that this is God. Again, whenever he would talk to the Pharisees, what did they say? What? Isn't this, this guy says that his father is God, but isn't this Joseph's son? He's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? In his earthly ministry, Jesus was known for loving the unlovable. A few weeks we talked about Zacchaeus, remember? that The chief tax collector, and Jesus came to see him. And at Jesus' death, he was nailed to a cross between two criminals. But Jesus humbled himself, verse 8 says. Nobody humbled Jesus. Look at John 10. It says, no one takes, this is Jesus speaking, it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. But the text goes further and says that he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In the Roman Empire, the crucifixion, that was the cruelest form of execution, and they hardly ever even did it to their own citizens. The only Roman citizens that were crucified were those convicted of high treason. It was usually only reserved for lower class and slaves. And here's Jesus 
the king of heaven between two thieves. I was, I don't know, I guess I was in a movie mood this week. I really don't watch any movie. I didn't even watch that movie, but I just thought of that clip. Jesus went from the highest position of man imaginable to the lowest because of his love for us. I was, um, I got an email of Bethany and I are in the Disney movie club. We buy, of course, Disney movies for our kids. And the advertisement was for the Lion King that came out this summer. And in the trailer, I watched it, and I was about to boo-hoo in the office watching the Lion King trailer. These roofers really thought I was a tough guy this week. They're coming in to use the restroom and hear me watching Lion King trailer and boo-hooing. But listen to, this, listen to this quote from the Lion King trailer. While others search for what they can take, a true king searches for what he can give. Man, I'm about to boo-hoo just thinking about that. Is that not our King Jesus? While others search for what they can take, a true King searches for what He can give. And as Christians, we should be marked by service and love to others because of what our King Jesus did for us on the cross. And then lastly, we're to bow the knee and exalt Jesus. Verse 9, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus, He humbled Himself, and God the Father exalted Him. Now, this is kind of a, this is an interesting, interesting thing. The, uh, the thought when you read the verse, when you say... Um, that God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, the natural reaction is to say, well, that name, of course, is Jesus. And if you, have that, if you, if you say that, that was, that's it, then I, we're not going to argue about it. But he says that that's the name. So then he says, verse 10, So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. But then verse 11, he says, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus, he already had the name Jesus, didn't he? Before he was crucified, didn't he have the name Jesus? The name that is given to Jesus is Lord. And look at, look at Isaiah on the screen, Isaiah 45. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me, or shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me. Our righteousness and strength to him who to him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. Paul is referencing this. And he said, That knee shall bow. Y'all see that in the text. But that Jesus is Lord. Again, who is Lord in Philippi? Caesar. But God, but the Father has given Jesus the name Lord. And notice in verses 10 and 11, well, as we just talked about, whenever, many per Christians were persecuted and killed because they said Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord. And every week as Christians, we gather to say what? Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar, not Donald Trump, not any other world leader that you can think of. They're, they're not lords. Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. In order for us to be saved, we have to say that Jesus is Lord. And Lord means Lord over all creation and Lord over all of our lives. At Christ's exaltation, Jesus will be acknowledged by all creation as the Lord of all creation. Every person, verse, seven, or verse uh, 10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee will bow. Every person will bow the knee. Even Pilate, the person that had him to be, ordered him to be crucified, Pilate will bow the knee to Jesus. Some will confess Jesus as Lord with great joy and others will confess him as Lord with great despair and anguish. But we will all bow to Jesus 
whether we choose to or whether why, or if He makes us. And then lastly, to the glory of God the Father. I love that. Paul tells us that we should be unified. And you know who else is unified? The Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus came and humbled Himself and that God the Father will exalt Him. And, that, and that's to the glory of God the Father. There's no rivalry in the Godhead, only delight and unity. So in, in conclusion this morning, do you have the attitude of Christ? Are you constantly trying to exalt yourself or are you humbling yourself and serving others? And then lastly, have you confessed that Jesus is Lord? Jesus is not just a good man. He's not just Savior. He is not a get out of hell free card, but He is the Lord of all creation. Notice that it says that they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is something that we continue, if we are in Christ, that we do this every day, that we confess Jesus is Lord. It's not that I confess Jesus is Savior when I walk down the aisle that one time, but we continually, ongoingly, if that's a word, confess that Jesus is Lord. Are you submitting to the Lordship in an area, or have you, are you bowing the knee to Christ in every area of your life, your finances, your entertainment, your schedule? Are you committing Sunday mornings to the church and to Jesus, your quiet times, your devotional times? As, as, as children, are you obeying your parents? Are you bowing the knee to Jesus in that area? Jesus is Lord of all. Or will we recognize Him for who He is this morning? Go ahead and stand as, we, as our musicians come and we're going to appropriately sing, I Surrender All.